The top stories tonight and why news. The Philippine government has no plans to impose a full or nationwide coronavirus lockdown. Meanwhile, two out of five Filipinos believe the Philippine economy will worsen in the next 12 months, according to a survey. Although the government has yet to announce the schedule of the clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine in the Philippines, the Department of Science and Technology is eyeing Metro Manila, Calabarzon and Cebu as trial zones for the clinical trial. Meanwhile, the DOH says that the reproduction number of COVID-19 in the country has declined. Some local government units complain about uncoordinated return of locally stranded individuals from various areas in the country. In response to this complaint, a joint task force COVID Shield tightens the issuance of travel authority to locally stranded individuals. The National Economic and Development Authority says the poverty incidence in the country may increase next year. If the government did nothing, the increase uh, in poverty would be more. And uh, that shows really that we can uh, do two things. Number one, provide temporary support to those who are in need. And number two, uh, change our policy uh, to risk management so that we can open up the economy more. The Australian Home Affairs Department has recently revoked the Australian visa of two Chinese scholars. Meanwhile, the United States has revoked visas for more than 1,000 Chinese nationals under a May 29 presidential proclamation. A teenage Brit British author becomes the youngest writer to win a major literary award after winning the Wainwright Prize 2020 for UK Nature Writing. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Thursday, September 10, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and in other parts of the world. I am Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. First in the news, Malacanang says the government has no plans to impose a full or nationwide coronavirus lockdown. Meanwhile, two out of five Filipinos believe the Philippine economy will worsen in the next 12 months. Rosa Licoz details why. Malacanang believes the country has already experienced the worst economic impact brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. In the following months, the country is geared towards economic recovery and the government has no plans to implement a nationwide enhanced community quarantine again. Hindi na po natin plano na magkaroon ng malawakang lockdowns. No? Um, mula nitong araw na ito, ilulunsad po natin yung bago nating uh, um, kampanya na uh, pinangalan ng Ingat Buhay para sa Hanap Buhay. This is also the palace's response following a survey conducted by the Social Weather Stations or SWS which shows that two of every five Filipinos believe that our economy will be in a worse situation in the next 12 months. This is equivalent to 40% of Filipinos who are economic pessimists. This is the highest number of economic pessimists since June 2008. According to Secretary Roque, if the public follow the government-imposed health protocols to combat coronavirus, our economy would recover and citizens could go back to work. Naintindihan po natin kung bakit pessimistic ang ating mga kababayan, pero ang sinasabi naman po ng mga economic managers, we have hit rock bottom and the only way to go is up. So kapit busy po tayo, hanap buhay po tayo lahat, bubuksan po natin ang ekonomiya, nandiyan pa rin po si COVID, pero kaya po natin pag-ingatan na ating mga sarili. The passage of the Bayanihan 2 Act, the 2021 National Budget, as well as the infrastructure projects under the Build, Build, Build program are expected to help our economy recuperate. 
Rosa Licos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Interagency Task Force Against COVID-19 will consult President Rodrigo Duterte on the proposal to allow health workers with contract as of August 28, 2020 to leave the country. The Philippine Overseas Employment Administration and the IATF have implemented an overseas deployment ban among medical and health allied workers since April due to the persisting health crisis in the country. Only those with employment contract as of March 8, 2020 are allowed to go out of the Philippines. However, a lot of health workers are appealing to the government to reconsider this policy since they have to work and sustain the needs of their families. Kailangan po muna pong konsultahin ang presidente kasi yung desisyon po na mag-impose muna ng moratorium ay desisyon po ng presidente at ayaw naman namin pangunahan po ang uh, ating presidente. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque personally believes that COVID-19 vaccine is behind the absolute pardon granted by President Rodrigo Duterte to convicted to convicted U.S. serviceman Joseph Scott Pemberton. Our Malacanang correspondent, Rosalie Cos, tells us why. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque says he is not against the decision of President Rodrigo Duterte to grant absolute pardon to U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Joseph Scott Pemberton, the convicted serviceman who killed Filipino Jennifer Laude. The palace official believes the action taken by the president is grounded on a broader national interest. He says this is to maintain good bilateral relations between the Philippines and the United States of America for the attainment of a coronavirus disease vaccine. I'm not surprised dahil panahon ng pandemic at alam ko pong emphasis ng ating presidente ay makakuha ng vaccine para sa mga Pilipino. At sa akin po, uh, pagamat uh, tayo po ang tumayong apogado ng pamilang laude, Eh, kung nga ibig sabihin naman yan, eh, lahat ng Pilipino ay magkakaroon ng vaccine kung mga Amerikano makadevelop, wala po akong problema dyan. Roque says the Philippines has still attained justice when Pemberton was convicted and detained. The Duterte administration also maintains its position to abrogate the Visiting Forces Agreement or VFA with the U.S., though it has been suspended for a year. Nagtagumpay po kami. Nakonvict po namin si Pemberton. Ang binura lang po ng presidente yung karagdagang parusa kung meron pa. Hindi po binura ng presidente yung desisyon na mamamatay tao po si Pemberton. Roque appeals to public to trust the wisdom of the president regarding his decisions that only a president can make. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Although the government has yet to announce the schedule of the clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine in the Philippines, the Department of Science and Technology is eyeing Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and Cebu as trial zones for the clinical trial. Joan Nano tells us why. In today's virtual conference, DOSC Secretary Fortunato de la Peña said that six barangays in Metro Manila, one barangay in Calabarzon, and one barangay also in Cebu are being considered in what they call zoning. According to Secretary de la Peña, high incidence of COVID-19 is one factor. This is in accordance with the recent resolution approved by the Interagency Task Force in setting zoning trials for the conduct of clinical trial. Ang priority sa zoning ay sa WHO solidarity trials pero uh, itiyakin natin na yung mga independent trials ay magkaroon din ng uh, trial zones. Ang uh, ipinipili kasing lugar ay yung mataas ang incidence ng COVID-19. So yung mga barangay na naroon o malapit doon, uh, usually it will require anywhere between 5 to 10 barangays uh, for a trial. Secretary De La Peña adds that we will be needing 1,000 volunteers for the Solidarity Trial led by the World Health Organization, while they are also estimating around 6,000 volunteers for the independent trial. The DOSC Secretary also cited that Philippines has signed a confidentiality agreement with seven makers of potential COVID-19 vaccines. Through this, the country will have access to data about clinical trials for our vaccine expert panel. The DOSC reiterates that we cannot fast track the process or formulation of COVID-19 vaccines as we have to consider the health and safety of everyone. 
Yung pong ating uh, tungkol sa bakuna, miski araw-arawin natin ang tanong, hindi natin mamamadali. Kaya tayo po ay sumunod sa mga sinasabi natin pag-iingat ng ating uh, uh, pamahalaan. Kailangan lang tayo magtsaga dahil ang bakuna po ay kailangan maging safe. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. There has been a decline in the reproduction number of COVID-19 in the Philippines. But the health department says that when the Philippines will be COVID-19 free remains uncertain. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, tells us why. From 0.977 last week, the reproduction number of COVID-19 has declined to 0.87 based on a DOH report yesterday. This means that a COVID-19 case infects an average of less than one person. According to the DOH, if the reproduction number continues to decline, it is expected that the daily case count will also drop. But the DOH remains unsure when we will be declared COVID-19 free. It's 28 days. Na wala tayong naitatalang kaso. Doon natin masasabi talaga that we really have been successful in all of these things that we are doing for this response. The DOH adds low COVID-19 transmission rate is not enough to determine that the Philippines is winning against the pandemic. Kailangan din natin tingnan ang kapasidad ng health system natin. Hindi lang lagi numbers ang titignan natin. So for example, if we are seeing a decreased number in cases, are we seeing our health system capacity being able to manage all of these uh, admissions, being able to contact trace properly, being able to uh, actively do surveillance, testing is adequate and accessible. The DOH also reports there are almost a thousand critical COVID-19 cases and almost 700 severe COVID-19 cases in the country as of today. Majority of them are elderly, but only 2% of the total number of cases have reached the critical and severe level yung mga vulnerable groups at saka yung may mga comorbid uh, conditions. Katulad ng uh, hypertension is the most common, may mga diabetes, may mga sakit sa bato. Ito po yung mga common pa rin na demographics itong mga pasyente natin na nagkakaroon ng severe or critical cases. The health department is confident that if the public remains responsible in observing health protocols, the country will not reach the projection of UP Octa Research, 330,000 COVID-19 cases by the end of September. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, in Butuan City, the Philippine National Police and the City Business Permit and Licensing Division raided a computer shop in Barangay Sikatuna. The computer shop reportedly produces fake rapid test results, which the suspects sell for 500 pesos each. Authorities arrested Eric Kailing, Raimundo Veloso Jr., and Rex Nathaniel Ramos Enriquez, who have been operating for about a month month now using the name of a medical diagnostic center in Butuan. Police said these suspects are facing charges for falsification of documents. Authorities are also tracing their customers to be held liable. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that 3,821 new cases were reported today based on tests done by 105 out of 117 current operational laboratories. More than 2,000 of those new cases were from the National Capital Region, while Rizal follows with almost 300. Cavite, Laguna and Bulacan all logged more than 100 cases each. Those figures raised the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to almost 249,000. The total active cases have increased to 58,823, of which 88.3% are in mild condition. We have lost 80 more patients, but through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 563 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 186,058. Thanks be to God.
Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of close to 27.9 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignty. India has a record jump in daily COVID-19 infections with over 95,000 new cases detected in a single day. The global coronavirus death toll surpasses 900,000, while close to 18.8 .8 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. Thanks be to God. Some local government units complain about uncoordinated return of locally stranded individuals from various areas in the country. While the Joint Task Force COVID Shield tightens the issuance of travel authority to LSIs returning home to their provinces and cities. Asher Kadapan Jr. details why. The Joint Task Force COVID Shield, hand in hand with the Philippine National Police, responds to the complaints raised by some local government units about a few locally stranded individuals or LSI returning from various areas in the country without proper coordination. Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Lorenzo Eleazar explains that a travel authority is a requirement among LSIs if they want to cross provincial borders and highly urbanized cities, but uncoordinated return of LSIs takes LGUs by surprise. Eleazar further says that this leads to the shortage of personnel to attend to the protocols that the returning LSIs have to undergo based on the guidelines implemented locally to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. The police official also emphasizes the need for receiving LGUs to have available quarantine facilities to accommodate them as well as adequate treatment centers for individuals who will test positive for COVID-19. The JTF COVID Shield intensifies the screening of the issuance of travel authority to LSIs returning to their hometowns. To obtain a travel authority, an individual should have a medical clearance certificate from the city or municipal health office submitted to the National Task Force Against COVID-19 through the help desk of the city or municipal police stations. Before a travel authority is released, there should be coordination with the receiving LGU, which includes the name of LSI, date of travel, and vehicles that will be used among others. All police commanders are tasked to strictly coordinate with the receiving LGU and their approval. Ang LSI ay hindi mabibigyan ng travel authority hanggang walang pahintulot ang LGU na kanilang uuwihan para sila ay bumiyahe. Sa ganitong paraan, mabibigyan ang sapat na panahon ng ating mga LGUs na maghanda at kontrolin ang pagpasok ng mga LSI sa kanilang mga lugar, lalo na yung mga galing sa Metro Manila kung saan maraming kaso ng COVID-19 infections. As additional countercheck measure, arriving LSIs will be checked by the police stations of receiving LGUs. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. More than 700 private schools across the country will not open in October. Dante Amento will join us tonight to, to explain why live. Yes, Dante. The economic collapse due to the COVID-19 pandemic is the primary reason the Department of Education sees why a number of private schools in the country have decided not to open this school year. Based on data from DepEd, out of more than 14,000 private schools nationwide, 748 will implement closure. 141 of those are in Region 3 or, or Central Zone, 121 in Region 4A or Calabar Zone and 96 in the National Capital Region. But Education Secretary Leonor Briones says this is just a temporary closure, particularly for this school year 2020-2021. If the current public health situation improves and the economy recovers, these private learning institutions will open again next year. Mag-improve ang economy, baka uh, magbago din sila ng kanilang pananaw. Oh, lalo na yung ibang may recognition na talaga sila. Ah, uh, ang sinasabi naman nila parang iba just parang temporary na for this year hindi sila magbubukas muna. Meanwhile, some 3,233 teachers have lost their jobs and 40,345 learners are also affected. Close to 4 
Thank you so much, Dante Avento, for that report. The Interagency Task Force Against COVID-19 is studying studying the proposal of temporary closing cemeteries in the country on November 1 and 2. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Spread if people flock to cemeteries on November 1 and 2. That is why the IATF plans to tackle a proposal of temporarily closing cemeteries in the country on November 1 and 2. According to presidential spokesperson Harry Roque, the high-ranking officials of the IATF are expected to talk about it soon. But Secretary Roque believes that regulation is one of the possible things that can be done to prevent the influx of people to the cemeteries. Titingnan po natin kung ano maging action ng IATF at uh, ako mismo po ang ating recommendation, gawin na lang natin na hindi All Saints Day kundi magkala tayo siguro ng apat hanggang limang araw depending yung sa um, family name ng namatay kung sino po pwede pumunta sa mga sementeryo na hindi po lahat magdagsaan sa isang araw lang. Pero titignan po natin kung ano maging decision ng IATF. Manila Mayor Esco Moreno has announced that all cemeteries in Manila City will be closed from October 31 to November 3. Mandaluyong Mayor Menchi Abalos as well as Marikina Mayor Marcelino Chodoro also announced that all cemeteries in their cities will be temporarily closed on October 30 to November 2. The San Juan LGU has also issued an executive order stating that cemeteries in the city will be closed on October 30 to November 3. In Valenzuela City, Private and public cemeteries will be closed on October 30 to November 3, 2020. Meanwhile, in a bid to regulate the number of individuals going to cemeteries, the Marikina LGU will implement the use of a cemetery pass. Ang iniisip natin ay 30% uh, 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 capacity lamang ang iaalaw o papayagan natin upang sa ganon, uh, walang pagsisiksikan at uh, Walang congestion na mangyayari sa loob ng mga sementeryo dito sa Marikina. Mayor Chodoro says they are eyeing the distribution of the cemetery pass by October 1. The cemetery pass can be requested from the cemetery administrators of various cemeteries in the city. Pag-process ng cemetery pass ay uh, kukuha na rin sila ng schedule kung kailan nila gagamitin yung cemetery pass. Yung cemetery pass ay one-time use lamang. Food. Tents and other things that may occupy space at the cemetery will be prohibited. Mayor Marcy Chodoro says they plan to implement the regulations starting October 15 until November 30, 2020. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. It is within the discretion of the Commission on Elections or Comelec to hold or postpone the voter registration. According to presidential spokesperson Harry Roque, the Interagency Task Force and the Metro Manila Council have recommended to postpone the voter registration due to the pandemic. However, as a constitutional body, it is the sole decision of Comelec. The nationwide voter registration for the May 2022 national elections began on September 1, 2020 and will run until September 30, 2021. Hindi po pwedeng diktahan ng constitutional body dahil ang COMELEC po ay constitutional body. We can only recommend to the COMELEC but the final decision will be with the COMELEC because it is a constitutional body tasked with the conduct of um, the voters registration. The Office of Civil Defense and the NDRRMC held the third quarter national simultaneous earthquake drill. But unlike usual drills, this was done online. Vincent Arboleda is back. Tell us why. The threat of COVID-19 still lingers. That is why the Office of Civil Defense, together with the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council or NDRRMC, held the third quarter national simultaneous earthquake drill online. According to Mark Timbal, NDRMC spokesperson, this is in accordance with the health protocols implemented by the Interagency Task Force. Kailangan po talaga nating sumunod dun sa mga reglamento na bawal po ang mga mass gathering at saka yung ating uh, social distancing or physical distancing requirements. The program started at 1 p.m. where various agencies discussed disaster preparedness particularly on earthquake. At 2 p.m., 
the ceremonial pressing of the button was done which signaled the start of the actual drill and the dock cover and hold procedure. Several government agencies participated in the online drill with several videos and pictures posted on social media. Some netizens even posted their participation in the dock cover and hold procedure. The NDRMC believes that the possibility of an earthquake happening despite the pandemic remains. Napapansin po natin sa mga palita na sa iba't ibang parte po ng Pilipinas, may mga nagaganap pa rin po ng mga lindol. Ibig sabihin po, ang, panganib, ang mga ibang panganib na ating kinaharap noon, hindi po sila nawawala habang may pandemic. DILG Undersecretary Jonathan Malaya mentioned a few days ago that the government wants every member of Filipino families to be prepared for when disasters strike. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, says the poverty incidence in the country may increase next year. During the budget briefing at the Senate, NEDA Acting Secretary Carl Kendrick Chua said the 2021 poverty incidence will range from 15.5% to 17.5%. This can be lower or slightly higher than the poverty incidence in 2018, which was 16.7%, equivalent to 17.7 .7 million Filipinos. Chua further said the government had been targeting to lower it down to 14 percent, but adjustments have to be made due to the COVID-19 pandemic. If the government did nothing, the increase uh, in poverty would be more. And uh, that shows really that we can uh, do two things. Number one, provide temporary support to those who are in need. And number two, uh, change our policy uh, to risk management so that we can open up the economy more. Meanwhile, NEDA adds the country's unemployment rate will likely drop between 6% and 8% next year or 7 million Filipinos. This is lower compared with a 10% unemployment rate recorded in July. According to Chua, this will depend on the economic recovery of the country from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the possible increase in the poverty incidence amid the COVID-19 crisis, Senator Sherwin Gachalian questioned the proposed budget of DSWD for 2021. We definitely need to uh, strengthen or even increase the social protection for our constituents, at least in the short term. So I, I am just uh, uh, quite uh, surprised that we reduce the budget of DSWD by half, more than half. Budget Secretary Wendel Avisado explained the 171 billion pesos proposed budget for DSWD next year is higher compared to the original budget of the agency, which is 164 billion pesos. However, the current budget of the DSWD increased to 366 billion pesos because of the Bayanihan One for the implementation of the social amelioration program. The DBM has earlier announced that there will be no funding for SAP next year. Gachalian also called on the government to retain the unconditional cash transfer or the 300 pesos per individual aid of the DSWD. Avisado says the DSWD budget is still open for review and adjustments in the congressional deliberations. Ito naman po dumadaan sa proseso and Congress always has the uh, prerogative also to review and uh, make some adjustments for if you think that there's more to do and uh, improve the budget for this uh, department Meanwhile, a lawmaker is seeking to require all public officers and employees to annually submit a medical certificate. Senate Bill No. 1818, filed by Senate President Vicente Soto III, aims to ensure that public officials are in a state of health that would enable them to perform their tasks sufficiently and provide prompt and adequate service to the public. Under the bill, the medical certificates shall be submitted on or before 
before April 30 every year and must be issued by a government physician after proper evaluation of the public official's physical examination and laboratory test results. However, the inspection or reproduction of the lab test results attached to the medical certificate will be excluded as these are confidential and private documents. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. The trough or extension of a low-pressure area is affecting parts of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, the LPA was located at 980 kilometers east of Baler Aurora. If you are going outdoors, ready your umbrellas because the trough of this LPA will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Bicol region, Visayas, Caraga, northern Mindanao, and Zamboanga Peninsula. Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to localized thunderstorms. Still, possible flash floods or landslides may occur during severe air thunderstorms. No tropical cyclone advisory is issued. The judiciary is asking, the, asking Congress for an addition of more than 6 billion pesos for its 2021 national budget. Despite the pandemic, the courts in the country continue to conduct hearings. One of our senior correspondents, Ray Palayo, tells us why. The judiciary's proposed budget for 2021 amounts to 43.54 billion pesos. This is lower than its 55.88 billion peso request from the Department of Budget and Management. During the briefing with the House Committee on Appropriations, Court Administrator Jose Maidas Marquez appealed to lawmakers to add 6.58 billion pesos. Most of the amount will be allotted for the improvement of internet connection in courts across the country. According to Marquez, during the community quarantine, they are using the internet to perform the court's mandate. The official disclosed that around 100,000 hearings have been conducted through video conferencing since March with an 87% success rate. It means that 13% of those online hearings were unsuccessful due to the poor internet connection or low bandwidth. While our judges are in court, uh, they, they uh, at their discretion, no? they, can, uh, they can allow the appearance of parties uh, virtually or remotely. No? So yung mga abogado po, they can appear in court while they are in their respective residences. Ang ating mga persons deprived of liberty, hindi na po aalis ng kulungan. Nandun po sila sa BJMP, kausap po natin ng BJMP dito, at tuloy-tuloy po ang mga hearings. Marquez said around 60,000 persons deprived of liberty have been released since March through video conference hearings. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Land Patrol of the Armed Forces of the Philippines and of the Philippine National Police operate round the clock in vital points on the Zamboanga Peninsula. Philippine Air Force air assets have also begun to fly over the area. The floating assets of the Philippine Navy and the Philippine Coast Guard have begun to patrol strategic coastal areas. These measures aim to prevent terrorists from escaping after their encounter with authorities yesterday in Zamboanga, Sibugay, where five terrorists were killed and around five others were able to run away. It's why the police and the military operatives have maintained their heightened level of alert. Nonetheless, for Zamboanga City alone, there has been no let up in our patrols, whether it's canine, uh, air patrols, uh, uh, sea patrols, as well as foot patrols. Mayor Ben Climaco also calls on the public to stay alert and report any suspicious individuals or items in their area. And for the news abroad, here's Maria Latosa reporting live from Perth, Australia. William, in England, from Monday, we are introducing the Rule of Six. You must not 
meet socially in groups of more than six, and if you do, you will be breaking the law. The rule applies in any setting, indoors or outdoors, at home or at the park, according to Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The ban will be imposed by the police and violators of the rule may face fine or even arrest. This single measure replaces both the existing ban on gatherings of more than 30 and the current guidance on allowing two households to meet indoors. Now you only need to remember the rule of six. However, limited exemptions to the rule include a household or support bubble with a group larger than six people. They can still gather. COVID-secure venues like places of worship, gyms, restaurants, and hospitality venues can still hold more than six in total. Education and work settings are unaffected by the rule. And according to Prime Minister Johnson, COVID-secure funerals and weddings can go ahead with a limit of up to 30 people. Organized ports can go proceed. Meanwhile, New South Wales Transport has earlier put in place hundreds of marshalling response and support teams at key train interchange locations. Joining us tonight is one of our fellow correspondents here in Australia to tell us why live. Marielle, to monitor physical distancing, assist with crowd management and provide guidance to customers that require assistance, New South Wales Transport has deployed hundreds of marshalling response and support teams at key interchange locations. However, the Rail, Tram and Bus Union of New South Wales has called on the New South Wales government to strengthen its messaging on the use of face coverings while using public transportation following the recent COVID-19 possible transmission risk of the virus when two infected passengers boarded the city bus in Sydney. The union further urged the New South Wales government to hire more COVID-19 marshals to enforce social distancing rules. Wearing a face mask or any face covering remains to be a strong recommendation from the state government and has not made mandatory. Keep your distance, leave at least one and a half metres between yourself and other people. And wear a mask on public transport, ride shares, taxis, shopping, uh, places of worship and other places where you can't physically distance. The last 14-day data showed there were close to 20 million times of people tap on their bus and train cards to board public transport in New South Wales. 13.6 million times account for the bus tap-ons while 6 million times on Metro Train. New South Wales currently has 3,953 confirmed cases and then and done close to 2.4 million COVID tests. Marielle? Earl, could you give us an update on the rate of community transmission now in New South Wales? Marielle, based on the current weekly data comparison, the community transmission rate is 50% lower than last week. Although there's still a small number of mystery cases under investigation, these cases seem to be under control. Actually, the New South Wales has been praised by Prime Minister Scott Morrison because of its strong integrated tracing capability. Marielle? Thank you, Early Briones, for that report. Singapore will begin handing out trace together contact tracing devices across the nation next week. The app has been downloaded 2.4 million times. The Bluetooth-enabled tokens are aimed at people who do not own or prefer not to use a mobile phone. The free devices have unique QR codes and a battery life of up to nine months. Singapore strengthens its contact tracing network to prepare for larger gatherings as restrictions are slowly being relaxed. A pilot scheme to use either the free tokens or the mobile app to check in at certain venues will also start in October. The Australian Home Affairs Department has recently revoked the Australian visa of two Chinese scholars, Professor Chen Hong and Australian Studies scholar Li Jianjun.
The unprecedented revocation of their Australian visa was due to the advice from the Australian Security Intelligence Organization of an alleged risk to Australia's national security. Professor Chen and Mr. Lee manage the Australian Study Centers in East China Normal University located in Shanghai as well as the Beijing Foreign Studies University. According to Professor Chen, he was shocked to receive an email notifying him of visa cancellation on security grounds. He absolutely refuses this assessment and believes a gross mistake has been made regarding his relationship with Australia. Meanwhile, while Mr. Lee is one of the recipients of Australia-China scholarship grant amounting to 60,000 Australian dollars funded by BHP Billiton, but his student visa was also recently revoked. The continuing tension between Australia and China has led Foreign Minister Maurice Payne to change the government's advice in relation to China and highlighting the risk of arbitrary detention on the ground of national security. Both Chinese scholars are part of a social media WeChat group where it became a subject of Asia investigation and how it has been allegedly used to advance China's interests and policies. Meanwhile, the United States has revoked visas for more than 1,000 Chinese nationals under a May 29 presidential proclamation. The said proclamation suspends the entry as non-immigrants of certain students and researchers from China. A State Department spokeswoman said the visa action was being taken under a proclamation President Donald Trump announced on May 29 as part of the U.S. response to China's curbs on democracy in Hong Kong. The acting head of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, said earlier that Washington was blocking visas for certain Chinese graduate students and researchers with ties to China's military fusion strategy to prevent them from stealing and otherwise appropriating sensitive research. China said in June it resolutely opposed any U.S. move to restrict Chinese students from studying in the United States and urged Washington to do more to enhance mutual exchanges and understanding. Some 360,000 Chinese nationals study in the United States, according to data. U.S. President Donald Trump has been nominated for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize for his leadership in brokering the Abraham Accords. It brings about the full normalization of relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and marks a major step toward a more peaceful Middle East, according to a statement by the press secretary. This historic diplomatic breakthrough between Israel and the United uh, Arab Emirates is the most significant step toward peace in the Middle East in more than a quarter of a century. The nomination comes amid widespread international support for the peace accords and optimism that the region finally may be turning a corner. The press secretary adds, by uniting two of America's closest partners in the region, something many said could not be done, this agreement will create a more peaceful, secure, and prosperous Middle East. President Trump will host the Israeli and Emirati delegations for a signing ceremony of the Abraham Accords on September 15 at the White House. And those are the reasons behind the news here in Australia and in other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Maria Latosa, reporting live from Perth, Australia. A Filipino athlete has just made our flag proud. Ernest John E.J. Obiena won the 59th Ostrava Golden Spike Men's Pole Vault event on September 8 in Ostrava, Czech Republic. He scored 5.74 to beat French Paul vaulter Renaud Lavilny, who set a world record of 6.16 meter in the discipline in 2017, as well as American Sam Kendricks, who was the world's second best in 
and Ben's Palm Vault, who placed third. Currently, our very own EJ is placed number 16 in Ben's Palm Vault World Rankings. An autistic teenage author cannot believe winning a major literary award. For him, the recognition tells the community that the young voices matter, our ideas worthy, our stories captivating. Nina Armilio tells us why. A 16-year-old naturalist has become what is reckoned to be the youngest ever winner of a major literary award by scooping the Winright Prize UK Nature Writing. Dara McNulty actually completed his first book, The Diary of a Young Naturalist, before his 16th birthday. When he started writing his diary in March 2018 to express his isolation due to bullying and being autistic, his curiosity and joy in nature, he was writing his way out of grief, he says. The teen author says the outpourings on the pages of his books express his connection to the wildlife. And on these pages, he tries to explain the way he sees the world and describe how we weather the storms as a family. For the autistic teenager, the recognition is something special. This tells our community that our voices matter, our ideas worthy, our stories captivating. For the judges, the Diary of a Young Naturalist is a wonderful journal that fits around the personal endeavors and family experiences of the author, but ultimately it is shaped by the nature around us. The judges were captivated and would like to call for it to be immediately listed on the national curriculum. Such is the book's power to move and the urgency of the situation that we face. Dara's book even has a version for Italian readers. He is grateful for the surprising achievement. I'd like to say a massive thank you for allowing me to do this because when young autistic people are nurtured and accepted, miraculous things can happen. And this is certainly one of them. What's even more fascinating about Dara is he is willing to share his prize money to young people like him. It is astonishing and tremendous and I'm going to use the prize money to attempt to enhance people's lives. I'm going to put it into my eco group and to try and make um, young people, young writers lives easier. The Wainwright Prize is a literary award that was created in memory of Alfred Wainwright to celebrate nature writing and encourage exploration of the outdoors. Aside from being an author, a campaigner, and a naturalist, Dara dreams of becoming a scientist. Nino Armilio, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news September 10, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. Amangelo Castro III. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.